Welcome everyone to Daf Yomi one week at a time. Uh, this is our 15th lesson. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I hope your uh, Chagim were beautiful. Uh, and we are now, uh, as they say in Israel, after the Chagim, uh, which is when real life starts. Uh, so wishing everyone a wonderful winter. Uh, those of you uh, not in Israel, it actually just rained for the first time uh, in, in Jerusalem. So that's uh, very exciting, uh, the first rain. Uh, so especially since we just, uh, you know, started praying for rain a few days ago. So that was very exciting. Um, okay, today we are going to be reviewing DAF 99 through 106. And uh, for those of you um, who are as excited as I am, next week is our last um, our last lesson of Masechet Ketuvot. Uh, we will be making a siyum next week, so uh, everyone get your uh, party hats on uh, for next week. And uh, don't forget uh, to register for the next uh, Masechet, which will be Masechet Nedarim, uh, which maybe we will uh, will have a, a brief introduction next week as well. Uh, and next week we will have a, a class at our regular uh, Tuesday nights. Uh, or Tuesday daytime for those of you uh, in the States. Um, okay, DAF, we have a lot to do. So DAF 99, um, we are in the middle of discussing uh, a widow who inherits property. Um, and here the Gemara discusses if a woman sells property for less than the value uh, that it is, then it is invalid. Um, if it's the orphan's property, but if it was her property, then it's valid, meaning she's not allowed to, uh, you know, uh, um, sell something for at a loss for the orphans. Um, and um, the Gemara explains that what if a person sold less than what he was told to sell, right? Let's say here in Hebrew, the word is a shaliach, a messenger. Uh, if a person was sent uh, to do a job for somebody else uh, and they told him, right? So the Gemara gives the example, a person sent somebody else to buy a shirt uh, and gave him six slaim, right? They gave him six dollars to buy a shirt. And then the person bought a shirt for three and then he bought a talit for another three, meaning uh, he thought he was getting a bargain. Um, so the purchases are valid and uh, it does work, we see. Uh, so the Gemara says that um, in the case of the, the widow, um, the only the last sale is invalid. Uh, this is talking about the Mishnah that we learned last week, uh, that if she um, sells off the property uh, one piece of land at a time, uh, and the last one was uh, not the proper value, so that last sale is invalid, but all the previous sales are valid, so it does work. Um, right? What if he says, uh, again, to the messenger, sell this to one person, um, so then you can't sell it to two different people, uh, or maybe you can sell it to as many people as you want. Um, what if we're talking about something that doesn't have a set market value, right? If something doesn't have a sell set market value, so then you can sell it for any price. But um, the messenger can't make a big mistake, and if he does, then the sale is valid. Um, okay, the next Mishnah at the bottom of 99 uh, talks about evaluations made by the court. Uh, again, someone wants to sell some property, so the court values the, the property. Um, so let's say the court made a mistake by either a sixth above or below, so then the sale is invalid. Uh, we're going to see later on in the Gemara uh, the idea of a sixth. Uh, we understand that people can make a mistake up to a sixth, either above or below the value of something, but if something is beyond that sixth, then that would be uh, too far off 
uh, the, the market price, uh, and therefore the sale would be invalid. Uh, another opinion in the Mishnah uh, on Daf 99 tells us that, um, no, even if a court makes a mistake in the valuation of, let's say, property, um, even if it's above or below a six, the sale is still valid because we don't want to undermine the court, right? If a person made a mistake, a regular person on the street, then it would be invalid. But if it's a court, uh, we don't want to um, undermine the, the value of the court. Um, if it was, let's say, a very public case, uh, so then it would also be valid. Um, so here, uh, the, on Daf 100, we say that the, uh, here the Gemara asked, is the shaliach, remember we talked about a messenger, if, is a messenger like the widow, uh, which means that if she, he makes a mistake, so then the sale is invalid, or like the court, if he makes a mistake, the sale would still be valid. Um, so uh, the Gemara says, no, um, you uh, shaliach, meaning a messenger, cannot make any mistakes. And if he makes a mistake, then it would be invalid. Uh, and the, the law is that a court sale is invalid if they did make a mistake. So we do say uh, that uh, the sale would be invalid. Um, now there's a machloket if the orphans can protest against a court-appointed guardian when they grow up, right? Again, we're talking about um, things that the court does, um, and can we, I don't want to use the word undermine, but can we um, not accept what the court does? So let's say the court appointed a guardian for these orphans, and now they grow up. Can they fire this court-appointed um uh, person, or do we say no? Uh, we do not want to undermine the the validity of the court. Um, so uh, here we have, let's say, a, uh, if the widow or the court sell property, then the um, warranty or the guarantee for this property is for the heirs, uh, and they need to compensate if there is a problem with the with the sale, meaning even though the widow or the court are selling the property, ultimately it's the orphans, meaning it's the heirs to the estate that are responsible for this property. Um, another opinion is that the court can make a mistake up to half of the value, so that's more than a sixth, right, up to half, uh, they, can, they can make a mistake. Um, and it's also important to understand that the court needs to make their sales public, right? There's a public auction. And if not, um, again, if they make a mistake, then, then it would be invalid. Um, okay. Um, and it seems that, as we mentioned, uh, when a court does evaluate or do or make a sale, that um, the court must announce the sale, right? It's called hachraza. Hachraza means it, it, they make an announcement. Um, the Gemara, though, then right afterwards tells us that you they don't need to announce the sale of slaves of movable items or of documents. And the Gemara explains why each one does not have to be announced. Um, if they announce that they're going to be selling slaves, we're concerned that maybe they'll run away. Um, we're concerned if they're selling movable objects, maybe someone will come and steal it. Um, and so too with documents. Uh, and here the Gemara explains that some cities, uh, they said that the court did need to announce, and other cities, uh, they said that the court does not need to announce. Um, okay, the next Mishnah tells us that a girl who does Miun. If you remember, Miun is when a, a minor, a girl who's under 12, is married off by her brother or her mother, uh, and she has the ability 
to do, to do what's called miun, which means that um, she can say she doesn't want to be married to this person and just walk out of the marriage. She doesn't need a get. Uh, she just does miun. So if she does miun, um, so we're going to see that she doesn't get a ketuva because she is just leaving the marriage. Um, another person who does not get a ketuva is um, a what's called shnia, a secondary uh, arayot. If you remember, we learned in Masachet Yevamot that there are um, certain people who are forbidden, right? Forbidden relationships. Um, so this is not the biblical forbidden relationships, rather the secondary uh, relationships, meaning, uh, you know, three generations, or I would say a generation removed from the biblical forbidden relationship. So they too, uh, if, they, if they do get married, uh, if they get divorced, they do not get a ketuva. And the Ilonit. Ilonit was the woman uh, or a girl who turns out to um, not go through uh, not go through puberty. Um, so these women do not get a ketuva. Uh, they also do not get reimbursed for anything that their husbands use of their property. Um, they do not get uh, supported mizonot. They don't get supported uh, after they get divorced or if they were widowed. Um, and they don't get um, the worn clothes that were part of their dowry. Um, so the, the Gemara explains, again, we said for Miun, she doesn't get it because she's just leaving the marriage. Uh, and the other women, um, the Shniot, the forbidden relationships, we penalize her for getting into that relationship in the first place um, because her children will not become mamzerim. They will not become what we would call illegitimate children. Uh, then um, the Gemara thinks that the, a woman would be more likely to uh, initiate this relationship. Therefore, she is getting penalized. Um, and the Ilonit doesn't get a ketuva because um, it's the the whole marriage becomes annulled because he didn't know uh, that she was an Ilonit before they got married. So the, the marriage itself just dissolves uh, and therefore she does not get the ketuva. If he knew that she was an Ilonit when they got married and he married her anyway, then she does get a ketuva. Um, the Mishnah continues, if a high priest, a Kohen Gadol, marries a widow, which he's forbidden to do, uh, and they get divorced, or, uh, or a divorcee marries a priest, a Kohen, or a Mamzeret or Netina to a regular Jew, meaning uh, someone who is forbidden from marrying a Jew, um, then um, all of these women do get a Ketuva, uh, and here the Gemara, the Mishnah even explains why does the woman get the ketuvah? Because here we're going to penalize the husband for getting into this marriage in the first place, right? Again, as we saw before, um, these relationships were forbidden uh, or are forbidden. Um, but the question here, and I think it's very sensitive, uh, the question is who pushed this relationship, right? Or who said, ah, it's okay, let's just get married, right? So we saw in the first case, uh, the woman doesn't mind getting into this relationship because her children will not be seen as illegitimate, so she doesn't mind getting married. Uh, but here in this case, the children will become uh, mamzerim, illegitimate, so therefore we assume that she did not want to get married <coughs> and that he pressured her and if that's the case, we're going to penalize him and make him pay for the ketuva, uh, even though it's fascinating that really um, they should not have been in that relationship in the first place. Okay, let's go to the Gemara on the bottom of Daf 100. Rav says that if a minor girl gets divorced, she doesn't get a ketuva. Shmuel says only if she does miyun, but if, right, miyun means she just gets up and walks away, but if she actually gets divorced, so then he says that she does get her ketuvah. Um, the top of Daf 101, um, if 
she does miyun, she needs to wait three months in order to get remarried. Uh, right, again, in general, when a woman gets divorced, we say she has to wait three months before she gets married again. Um, but here, uh, so we say that um, she also needs to wait three months, um, but everything else is annulled. It's as if she wasn't married, so much so that this woman can marry a priest, meaning can marry a Kohen, because uh, she's not seen as a divorcee. She's not seen as someone who was married uh, previously. Um, okay, so that actually seems to be a machloket, if she's seen as being married or not. Um, okay, um, here the Gemara says, maybe when we said she doesn't get the ketuvah, it means the 100 or the 200, right? The, the base price of the ketuvah. Uh, right, they don't get a hundred or two two hundred, but they do get the tosefet. Right, the tosefet means the extra um, that he added to the ktuva. So the add the additions she does get um, if she leaves um, because there's some sort of rumor that something happened with her. Um, so then she only gets her nichse melog. If you remember nichse melog is the the property that she brought into the marriage um, that she gets to leave with the marriage. However, if she has an affair, the Gemara says she can take back, uh, you know, the clothing, uh, you know, the clothing that she's wearing, uh, but that's about it, right? She, can't, she doesn't get anything else. Um, and if a Kohen Gadol, if the high priest, knew that the woman was a widow when he married her, then she does get her ktuva. Or no, that is only the case with the ailonit that we mentioned before, but not in the case of uh, the Kohen Gadol. Uh, and with that, uh, we finish, uh, I think it is the 11th chapter. Let me just confirm that. Uh, that yes, uh, we finished the 11th chapter, uh, and now we are going to uh, begin and complete the 12th chapter. So here we go. Um, the Mishnah tells us, um, the case is that a man marries a woman, and he promises to support her daughter, meaning she's coming into the marriage with a daughter from a previous marriage. And he says, I'm going to support your daughter or right now my stepdaughter for the next five years. So he needs to do that, even if they get divorced. Right. So let's say she now divorces him and she marries somebody else. And she tells the new and and she gets the new husband to also right. He promises to support the daughter for five years, same daughter. Um, so now the Mishnah tells us both husbands need to support this daughter. Um, so the the Mishnah explains how this works. Um, one has to give her the food, and the other one has to give her money for her food, right? So she's, if you're following, right, she's going to end up getting double the amount that she was supposed to get. Uh, and that seems to be okay. If the daughter gets married, so now the husband, right, her husband supports her and the stepfathers give her money, meaning the stepfathers still promise to support her for five years. So they support her. They don't have to give her food, but they need to give her money. If the the stepfather dies, so now um, she still gets money from the the estate that the father left, and not only from what's uh, free, right? What's um, I, guess, I don't think the word is liquid, but whatever's available, not only the land that is available, but she can even go and get land that was signed as uh, a guarantee for her money, meaning um, it, this she is seen as a creditor and she can collect the field as a creditor. Um, however, right, let's say there are uh, natural daughters who inherit, they can only get from the free field, meaning the fields that are uh, currently uh, in the estate. They cannot go and try to collect uh, from things that were 
sold previously. Uh, and the Mishnah ends uh, by saying that if he was smart, he would write in the original document, I'll support your daughter as long as we're married. Uh, so this is uh, good advice, right? If he doesn't write that, as we see, even if they get divorced, she still needs to, uh, he still needs to support her. Uh, one second. Okay, let's go to the Gemara. Um, so the Gemara says, uh, let's say Ruvain tells his friend Shimon that he owes him, meaning Ruvain, owes Shimon a hundred shekel, right? You go to the person, oh my gosh, I can't believe I see you. Wow, I owe you a hundred shekel. So now there's a machloket if, if Ruvain needs to pay Shimon, right? If I admit to owing you money, is that enough to obligate me to pay you the money, um, right? Um, it's as if, the, the Gemara explains, it's as if I gave you an unsigned IOU, right? I write on a napkin, I owe you 100 shekel, right? Does that count or not? Um, right, does saying it uh, make it formal and therefore he needs to pay, right? He admitted it, so he has to pay it. Or no, it's not enough to just say it, uh, and even though it's very nice if you want to pay it, uh, but Shimon can't take Reuven to court and say, you owe me money. Um, so the top, the top of 102 tells us that this is like our Mishnah, right? Uh, the Mishnah is, right, it's like an IOU, um, and we say, no, our Mishnah is a real document, right? The, hus the husband said, I'm going to support your daughter, right? Even if there were no witnesses to that document, as long as he said uh, that he was going to do it, it works. Um, and here, the Gemara mentions the idea of a verbal acquisition, right? I, we can, you know, uh, I don't want to use the word shake, but we could uh, have a, an agreement between two people that's only verbal, and that is binding to an, a certain extent. Uh, so here the Gemara gives an example of pidyon haben. If you remember, uh, I think we have learned this before, right? When uh, a, a firstborn a child is a male, and it is, the, uh, right, it's a boy, and um, the mother did not have any previous births, uh, including miscarriages, um, then um, you need to do what's called a pidyon haben. It's a ceremony that's done with a kohen, excuse me, um, where um, the father gives five silver coins to the Kohen, and the Kohen uh, gives the baby back to its parents. Um, and uh, this ceremony is called a Pidyon Haben. So what happens if a person writes to the Kohen, I owe you five Sla'im, right? I don't have it here with me. Does it work, right? So the Gemara says it doesn't work for Pidyon, meaning the child was not redeemed. Um, and the Gemara suggests, well, maybe that's because it's biblical and the, 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 the money has to be there right there. Um, or maybe it really does work when he actually pays him the money that he owes him. Uh, but still, don't do this um, so that you don't think that you can do Pidyon Haben with a document. So you shouldn't do that. Um, what happens if guarantors are added to a document after the witnesses signed it. Um, so then again, the Gemara says this is like an unsigned IOU, and it seems that it works, um, and you can collect from that guarantor's field. Or we say, no, um, the, the guarantor, the Arev, is not obligated to pay because uh, there was no signed document uh, that said that he was the guarantor. Since we're speaking about verbal agreements, so here we have the case of a father of a bride uh, and the father of the groom are sitting at the table and they're discussing how much each of them is going to give the couple, right? I'll give this much, I'll give that much. Uh, and then uh, the couple gets engaged. 
So the, the Gemara explains that they're obligated to give what they promised, even though they didn't write it down in a contract and they didn't sign anything. Uh, the fact that there was a verbal agreement is enough. Um, the, the Gemara suggests, well, maybe that's only if um, the bride is a na'ara, she's young, she's between 12 and 12 and a half, where the father is going to benefit. Uh, remember, he gets the kiddushin money, uh, but maybe not if she, she's an adult where the father won't benefit. And the Gemara says, no, even if she's an adult, and uh, they decided that this is what each person is going to give, uh, that is an obligation, uh, and therefore they need to pay what they said they were going to pay. Um, interestingly, though, the Gemara explains that you cannot write down things that were verbally agreed to for an upcoming marriage, meaning if it was a verbal agreement, it stays a verbal agreement. You don't turn it into a written document. Um, but the Mishnah did mention that a verbal agreement was written down, right? The Mishnah mentioned the husband said he would uh, support the daughter, and then it seemed to have been written down. Um, so the Gemara set, brings uh, a few examples of verbal agreement that seem to be written down as well. Uh, so it seems that that could be an option. Um, the stepdaughter uh, is, ah, so the Gemara says that the stepdaughter is around at the time of the agreement, therefore she becomes a creditor, um, and he owes her the money, and as we mentioned, she can collect it from all property, uh, but as we mentioned, his daughters, right, the heirs, um, were not around, and therefore can only be supported with the free property. Um, Okay, and here the Gemara tells us that the daughter always lives with her mother. It's interesting, in the time of the, the Gemara, uh, if there was a divorce uh, or uh, if the woman was widowed, it seems the daughter always went with, uh, always went with her mother. Um, okay. Um, um, okay, let's go to the next Mishnah on Daf 103. Um, the widow says... I don't want to leave this house, uh, right? She's staying, she, she stays in her home uh, with, that she had with her husband, and she doesn't want to leave. The heirs cannot kick her out, and they have to support her as long as she stays uh, in the house. If she says, I want to live with my, in my father's house, then they can say, okay, if you live with us, we'll support you. But if we leave, so then we're not supporting you anymore, right? You're going back home to your father. If she says, listen, we're all very young, right? Let's say um, maybe the husband had sons from a previous marriage and she's a young woman, right? If, if she says, we're all very young and it's inappropriate for me to live with you, so then she can leave and they still need to support her. Okay, so the Gemara explains that the the widow can use the husband's house like she did when he was alive, right? Meaning, because it says in her ketuva that she can stay there. Um, and the Gemara says that's only if it's a regular size house. But if it's, you know, and if it's big enough for everyone. If it's not big enough, um, if it's not big enough for everyone, so then that is not the case. Um, and the flip side of that discussion is that the orphans can't sell the house if the widow wants to live there, right? They can't say, listen, it's uh, three against one. We had a meeting. We decided we're selling the house. You're out of here. No, she has the right to stay there as long as she wants. Um, the Gemara now kind of uh, sidetracks a little bit and, and gives us some uh, advice. It says the more people that live in a house, the more wealth there will be in the house um, and uh, the importance of, uh, of that, of people being in the house. Um, and here uh, we are going to now have uh, a long story about the death of Rebbe, right? Rebbe is Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi, um, the great 
uh, Tanaitic sage who wrote down the Mishnah. Uh, and we're going to have a very uh, vivid description about uh, his death, basically the events leading up to his death and the, his death itself. Um, so the Gemara says that when Rebbe uh, was, ab- uh, was about to die, so he called in his children and he told them what they need to do when he dies. Right? They, he, they need to honor his mo- their mother. It uh, turns out she's his, their stepmother. Uh, and the reason he has to say it is because it's not so clear that uh, stepchildren will honor their stepmother after their father dies. Um, so he tells them uh, to honor her. Um, and, um, and he says, uh, these two people served me while I was alive, and they're going to serve me in my death. Uh, it seems that they died before him, and you shouldn't think that they died before him because they did something wrong. Rather, they died before him so that they can serve him um, in the world to come, which is an, uh, an interesting uh, idea. Um, the Rebbe then called the sages of the time and told them to return to study 30 days after mourning, meaning after uh, I, he dies, uh, you can mourn for 30 days, but then that's it. Go back to learning. Um, they t- he told them that his son Shimon is the Chacham, meaning he is wise, and Gamliel, his son, should be the Nasi, the leader, and Hananiah Bar Chama should be the Rosh Yeshiva. Right? So he, set, he basically set up who is going to take over for him um, sorry, after he dies. Um, he also said, uh, don't eulogize me in, a sm- in the small villages. We don't want to bother them, only in the big towns. Um, and the Gemara explains why each of these things, uh, why he said the, the, all of the previous things. When Rebbe died, a heavenly voice, a bat call, came out and said, anyone who was there when Rebbe died gets into Olam Haba if they were there at that moment. They, come, they can come to the world to come. Um, Gamliel, so remember we said Gamliel is going to be the Nasi, the leader. Um, so Gamliel was older. So the Gemara says, isn't it obvious that he would be the Nasi? It seems that he's not the smartest brother, um, but he did have fear of sin. Uh, and because he had fear of sin, he was, he was uh, appointed by Rebbe to be his successor, um, even though he wasn't necessarily uh, the smartest guy for the job. But it seems that he was the best guy for the job. Uh, Rebbe Han, um, Hanina uh, didn't become... Ah, so he was supposed to become the Rosh Yeshiva. He was supposed to be the head of the uh, academy. Um, but he didn't because Rebbe Afes was older than him. Uh, and he basically said, you know, I, want, I think you should be, right, you're older, you're greater. Uh, you should be the head of the uh, Yeshiva. Um, and in, and so he appointed him the head of the yeshiva, and then Rabbi Hanania um, stayed outside um, when you know so as to not cause um, I guess discomfort uh, in the Beit Midrash when Rabbi Afes died. So then Rabbi Hanina became the Rosh Yeshiva, um, and Levi who kept uh, kept Rabbi Hanina company outside, now he had nowhere to go, uh, so, so he decides to go to Bavel, right? This whole story is happening in Israel. Um, Levi went to Bavel, and there's a whole story how when he gets to Bavel, Rav understood exactly what happened when he saw him, right? He said, ah, the only reason you're here, it must be that, uh, sorry, Rav, I think I said, I might have said Rebbe, Rav, uh, right, Rav and Shmuel. Rav lived in Bavel, um, and Rav, when he saw Levi, understood exactly what happened without uh, being told, right, he understood that Rebbe died, he understood that Rabbi Hanina, uh, right, wasn't the head of the yeshiva and then became the head of the yeshiva. 
Um, okay, let's go back to Rebbe. Uh, he didn't die yet. So uh, Rebbe was crying uh, when they came to visit him when he was sick. Um, and then they said to him, but it was taught that if you die while laughing, it's a good omen. But if you're crying, it's a bad omen. Um, so they, they asked, why are you crying? Right? And here the Gemara lists uh, a list of good and bad omens. Um, and, uh, you know, it's all about things, right? If you're doing this at the time of death, it's a good sign. And if you do this, it's a bad sign. So uh, you can look that up. It's on DAF 103. Um, and they continue, why was he crying? Uh, Rebbe was crying because of all the Torah and the mitzvot he won't be able to do when he dies. Um, so just not because he was afraid, um, but... Um, but because uh, he would not be able to learn uh, enough Torah. Uh, then Rebbe called in his youngest son, and he taught him Kabbalah. And then he called in his older son, and he ta- his oldest, and he taught him how to be a Nasi. Right? Maybe that goes back to the fact that he wasn't necessarily the smartest, um, but uh, he wanted to teach him uh, how to be a good leader. Um, and the Gemara then tells us that Rebbe died in the city of Tsipori, uh, which, by the way, still exists nowadays. You can go see it up north in the Galilee. Um, but then they brought him to Beit Sha'arim, uh, right? They buried him in Beit Sha'arim, which is in another town in the Galilee as well. Uh, the Gemara explains that really he lived in Beit Sha'arim, uh, but when he got sick, they brought him to Tsipori because Tsipori is up on a mountain and the air is fresher there. So they brought him there when he was sick. Uh, but then after they, he died, uh, they brought him back to Beit Sha'arim. Okay, Daf 104, we're continuing. Um, we're going to get to the actual death. Uh, the rabbis declared a fast and a prayer on the last day of Rebbe's life, right? They saw that things were getting really bad, uh, and they said everybody needs to pray as much as possible and to fast. Um, and now we have a story about Rebbe's maidservant. Um, we're going to see that she's very sensitive, uh, and uh, she was, you know, very respectful, very close with Rebbe. Um, so it says that she went up to the roof uh, to Davin, uh, to pray for Rebbe. And there's a, a beautiful image that she says, uh, I feel like, you know, the angels are pulling him up and the sages are pulling him down, right? And there's this tug of war. And she says, I hope that, you know, we win the tug of war. I want him to live. Uh, but then when she went back into the house and she saw how much Rebbe was suffering, uh, it seems that he was suffering from uh, intestinal uh, an, an illness. He was going to the bathroom a lot. He was in a lot of pain. Uh, she goes back up to the roof and now she prays, you know, I hope that in that tug of war, now I hope that the angels win. Uh, this is actually uh, a source that some people use to say that if someone is really suffering, uh, it might be okay to pray for them uh, to have a merciful death. Uh, because, you know, they're suffering so much in this life. Um, so she prays. Uh, interesting, though, he, her prayer is not answered just yet. Um, so she takes a clay pot and she throws it off of the roof. Uh, and if you remember, we had a similar story with actually King David with David HaMelech, right? What happens when someone is startled, right? You, you stop for a minute, you take a breath. Uh, and you stop praying, or in David's case, he stopped learning. Uh, and at that exact moment, right, again, if there's a tug of war, if you let go of the rope for just one second, you you lose the tug of war. Um, and therefore, um, Rebbe died exactly at that moment. Uh, and a voice came out, a heavenly voice came out, and said that he, sh- he will come in peace. Uh, it's interesting, right? In peace, bis shalom, uh, we say when someone dies. Uh, when someone is alive, you say lech lishalom, right? Go to peace, toward peace, right? Uh, the way I remember it is you say to someone, right, rest in peace, right? Bis shalom, uh, that is said when people die. Um, so, uh, right, the rest, uh, he will now have rest 
uh, in heaven. Uh, and here uh, the Gemara finishes the story by saying that when righteous people die, uh, they're greeted by other righteous people, uh, or they're greeted by three group, groups of angels, uh, and they're taken uh, to the next world, uh, and evil people are met by uh, evil angels of destruction, uh, and they do not have peace in their death. Okay, um, next Mishnah on Daf 104. Um, Rabbi May, oops, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, Rabbi Mayer says that a widow that lives in her father's house can always collect her ktuva. Remember, we discussed in the previous Mishnah, uh, you know, if the if the widow stays in the in the original house or she goes back to her father. So Rabbi Meir says if she goes back to her father, she can always collect her ktuva. But if she lives with the heirs, she can only collect her. She not only she can collect her ktuva um, for up to twenty five years. Seems to be a very long time, uh, but after 25 years, uh, she cannot because Rabbi Meir says that um, while she's living in the house, she's using the money of the estate, and she probably is spending right the money of her ktuva. So we say up to 25 years. That's it. Uh, after 25 years, she doesn't get her ktuva anymore. The sages say the opposite. It's 25 years if she's in her father's house, um, because we assume that after 25 years, she probably just doesn't want it anymore. But if she's living with the heirs, she can always uh, get her ktuva. And, and if she dies, her heirs also are within that 25-year timing, uh, not, not from when she dies, but when the original father or husband died. Okay, so the Gemara explains, um, 25 years, it doesn't matter if she's a rich woman or a poor woman, woman it doesn't matter, everybody has a limit of 25, uh, 25 years, uh, and the Gemara asks, you know, what does it matter, 25 in a day, 25 minus a day, and we've seen this before, uh, the Gemara says that when the sages give us uh, any sort of limit uh, or amount, uh, they need to be exact, right? So uh, things need to be exact. And you're right, one thing here, one thing there is not a big deal, but uh, it is when I'm trying to set a limit. Uh, so it's 25 years, not 25 plus one day. Uh, just like the mikvah has to be a certain amount of water, if it's one teaspoon less, it is not a valid mikvah. So um, that is uh, that is how it works. Um, as we said, the divorcee, a divorcee is like a creditor, and she can always collect. She does not have that limitation. Um, and uh, if she um, asks for the ketuvah, so then the 25-year clock starts again. Um, and as long as she has her ketuvah document, she can collect her ketuvah, um, even, um, even if it's beyond those 25 years. Uh, and here there was a story of Rav Chia Aricha, who was supporting his brother's widow. His brother died. Uh, he was supporting her from the estate. The, the Gemara also mentions that it's actually his mother-in-law, which is interesting. Um, and it says that every day he would go and give her food. Uh, and after 25 years, he said, Okay, that's it, 25 years, so like we're finished. And she says, wait, what are you talking about? I want my ketuva. And he says, but I've been supporting you for 25 years and you didn't ask for it, so I assume that's it. Uh, and they actually go to court and she is found uh, to be correct and he needs to pay for her. Um, but it seems that uh, there's a mix-up in the document that the court writes her uh, for uh, going to seize the land. Uh, so she gets in, it gets a little bit complicated when she tries to seize the land, but she does not lose her ketuvah, and she is able to collect it even after 25 years. And with that, we finished the 12th chapter. Um, okay, we're going to do two more dapim. Um, so here we go. Um, we're going to be talking about judges now, uh, right? Because we've talked a little bit about courts beforehand. Uh, so now we're going to talk about judges. So the Mishnah says, 
um, at the bottom of 104, um, that there were two judges in Jerusalem who issued decrees. Uh, Hanan said two things. Admon said seven things. Uh, what are some of the things that they said? So Hanan said that a man who goes overseas and his wife wants support, um, she doesn't have to swear in the beginning in order to get support. Um, Daf 105 at the top, when she finds out that the husband dies, now she needs to swear that she didn't collect, you know, any money that she wasn't supposed to, and then she gets her ketuvah. Or another opinion in the Mishnah is that she needs to swear in the beginning and at the end, meaning at the, at the, both times. Okay, so now the Gemara explains, but wait a minute, we have a Brita that says that there were three judges um, who judged about thefts in Jerusalem, and this is like um, uh, uh, not a play on words, but the two words sound similar, right? Gzelot means theft, and gzerot with a resh, uh, gzerot means decrees. So it seems that maybe there's like, maybe we're talking about the same thing. And the Gemara says, no, uh, these people made decrees about thefts, right? They made gzerot about gzelot. Uh, and these are actually the same judges. Uh, and the Gemara says, wait a minute, there were only three or two, but we know that there were 394 courts and shuls uh, in Jerusalem, uh, which is true. Uh, but it seems that there were only three judges that actually made decrees. Um, and uh, these judges were paid 99 mané, right, 99 like, like shekel, I mean more, um, from the collection of the temple. This is called Trumat Halishka. We're going to talk about it in a minute. Um, but Trumat Halishka, if you remember from Shkalim, that was a long time ago, um, but we learned about Machatzit shekel, the half shekel that was collected every year. That went into um, um, a, uh, the treasury, and that was called Trumat Halishka. So we're going to talk about that in a minute um, and what gets used for what. Um, and the Gemara says if that's not enough money for them, then we give them more than the 99. Uh, and here uh, we're going to start talking about are judges allowed to get a salary? Is it seen as you know, bribery. So here the Gemara is going to say that um, Karna, the judge, used to take money from both parties uh, who were sitting in his courthouse, right? He said, it's not a bribe. If I take money from both sides, that's not a bribe. Um, maybe, right, again, the idea is that he, I guess he says, I'm not going to take money um, to rule in your favor, you're just going to pay me for my time. All right, and the Gemara actually explains this. It's not a bribe, but rather it's a salary. Um, but the Gemara says, wait a minute, a judge isn't allowed to get a salary to be a judge. So we say, you're right. Uh, he's not getting paid to be a judge. Rather, he's getting compensation for um, the, the, the loss of money that he's having from not going to his other job, right? Because it's interesting to think about. Uh, I imagine there was something as a full-time judge, but here in the Gemara, we're discussing, uh, you know, smart people who also had a regular job, right? So this person was a job, had a, you know, he was a farmer, and now he can't show up to work because he's sitting in judgment of your case. So they paid him for right, his time that he was, right, his uh, salary that he was losing uh, from his other job. Uh, and from here, the Gemara talks about how bad bribery is, right? It blinds the eyes of the wise, uh, and uh, it just shows that you won't be able to think clearly. Um, and there's a verse that says that kings will uphold the world, and a man of gifts will ruin it. What does that mean? A king, right, is someone who has everything, therefore they won't accept a bribe. So th that person will uphold the world because that person will judge fairly. But a man of gifts, someone who gets gifts, i.e. bribes, they will ruin the world, um, right? Um, 
the Gemara says that judges that borrow things cannot sit in judgment, right? If I borrow a pot from you and then you come to me to get judged, I will probably, right, have some bias. Um, you can't accept money to judge, right? You can't say, oh, give me a hundred shekel. I promise I'm going to be completely impartial, right? That doesn't work. Um, you can't be the judge for people that you like or that you hate, right? Because we're concerned in both directions, um, right? You can't take, when it says you can't take bribes, that means financial or verbal or a service, right? And here at the bottom of 105, the Gemara gives stories of judges that became disqualified because um, the people did certain things for them, right? The ferryman brought them across the river, right? And he says, oh, I can't be a judge in your case because you just helped me out. Um, okay, our last daf, daf 106, um, the, the Gemara tells us it's a mitzvah to be a judge in a case. And it's also a mitzvah to honor the Torah. Uh, and here there's a story of Rav Nachman who put aside one case, actually a case of orphans, in order to judge a case that he thought was um, the relatives of a Torah scholar. He thought that he was um, right honoring the Torah by doing this, um, but it turns out that it was not true. Uh, and when the other litigant saw how much honor was given to this person, he didn't make his claim, and he ended up losing the case. Um, and it's really, uh, it was, um, it was tragic for this person. And it, they, it was because of Rav Anan, meaning he implied that this person was a relative of his, and as a consequence of his actions, Eliyahu Hanavi right? Elijah the prophet stopped coming to him to teach him Torah, right? It seems that he used to come to him often, and after this incident, he stopped coming. Uh, so he fasted and he prayed, uh, and then Eliyahu came back. Uh, but when he came back, he came in these very scary forms. Uh, so he actually built a box uh, to be inside, uh, and then he was able to uh, learn from Eliyahu. Uh, since we're talking about a time of famine and Eliyahu. So in the time of Rav Yosef, there was also a famine and they asked him to pray. And Rav Yosef said, how could I be, how could I uh, pray if Elisha, right, Elisha from the book of Kings, uh, who is a prophet, right, if he had all these students who, who needed to support, for him to support them and he didn't pray for mercy, how am I supposed to pray for mercy, meaning I'm not uh, uh, worthy of doing such a thing. Okay, let's talk about the Truma Talishka, as I mentioned before, the communal funds of the temple. Uh, this, as I mentioned, is from the half a shekel, the machatzita shekel of the new year, and it's used for salaries of the Beit HaMikdash, right? If anybody would come, any workers of the temple, uh, they would be um, paid from this money, right? Also, people who would fix the Torah scrolls in Jerusalem and the women who wove the curtains in the temple. Um, and now the Gemara says, wait a minute, if the women are weaving curtains for the, for the temple, shouldn't those curtains, the, the money for those curtains come from another part of the treasury, which is called Bedek Habayit. Bedek Habayit is um, the money for maintenance of the building of the temple of the Beit HaMikdash. So the Gemara says, aren't these curtains, right, part of the building? And if they're, right, if they're part of the building, it should come from the building fund, not from the salary fund. Uh, and here the Gemara says that there were actually 13 curtains in the temple. Um, there were, in the second temple, there were seven in the doorways, uh, one in the entrance to the Hechal, to the main uh, building, one into the Ulam, into the Kodesh, right, into the, the sanctified area, um, and then two going into the, the Holy of Holies, right, Kodesh HaKodeshim. Um, and in the second floor, there are also two curtains up there. Um, 
So uh, here it seems again um, that these curtains, some of the curtains are part of the building and some are less part of the building. Uh, the Gemara now asks if we're talking about uh, what money is used for what? Uh, what about the service vessels, the clay hasharet, um, right? The the shovels, the they were made out of gold and silver. Where did uh, where did the money come from for those? Do we say that they're part of the temple service, meaning they're part of the altar, and therefore it should come from bedek habayit, what we would call the building fund, literally. Right? Or do we say that they're part of the sacrifice, and the sacrifice comes from Trumat Alishka, from the Machatit shekel, from the Hafa shekel? So Rav says it comes from Trumat Alishka, meaning it's like the sacrifice, which comes from Trumat Alishka. Um, how about the incense and the sacrifices? Those, again, those also come from Trumat Alishka. Again, the uh, general communal fund of the the temple, um, and uh, here it says that the klea sharet, the the service vessels, come from what's left over of trumat halishka, meaning last year's trumat halishka. Um, and here uh, the Gemara just ends telling us that they used to buy produce in the temple uh, and right with whatever money they had left over and then they would sell that produce at a higher price and with the extra money they would buy animals for something called kites or kites hamizbeach uh, and what is this uh, this is when let's say it was a slow day in the temple uh, there weren't a lot of people bringing sacrifices um, so they would offer up um, you know, extra sacrifices so that the altar would constantly be burning uh, and, uh, right, it should, out of respect, uh, and therefore um, they would uh, buy uh, more animals in order to put it on uh, on the Mizbech. Again, here, uh, there's a machlok at where the money came from to buy this produce, right? Again, is it seen as... Um, is it seen as uh, part of the altar or is it part of the sacrifices? Uh, okay, uh, I see Lynn has a comment. Some who corrected corrupted text also is Jew fund. Would removing a heretical gloss in the uh, not the corrupted text and require correction of that? Wait, I didn't understand. One second. Some who corrected corrupted text also with Jew funds would removing a heretical gloss also be part of the command to not possess corrupted text and require uh interesting um i am not sure uh i'm not sure uh you're saying uh i'm not sure in terms of um when they would um fix the text uh there were different ways uh, of fixing a text right it could be that there was actually a mistake uh and that they would uh, they would uh, be paid for that. That's what I was talking about. Um, but here you're talking about a corrupted text. I'm not sure exactly uh, what you mean in terms of... Um, I'm not sure exactly how to answer your question. Um, so if you want to rephrase, <laughs> uh, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but uh, here the Gemara is talking about um, where the salaries are coming from for the people who are doing this work. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm happy to uh, answer the question if you can rephrase it a little bit. Uh, but otherwise, kola um, kavod for our uh, penultimate uh, shiur. Uh, oh, wait, hold on. Lynn wrote more. The good text has been marked with an inappropriate elucidation. Um, Yes, and then I still don't understand the question. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, I'm just going to stop the recording. I uh, just want to wish everyone a Shabbat Shalom, uh, and I will see you, Be'ezrat uh, Hashem, next week for our final class of Masechet Ketuvot. 
Um, and uh, maybe uh, if you, uh, those of you who have your ktuba, maybe you can show your ktuba to uh, to the class. Maybe we'll do some uh, show and tell. My, actually, I see my mother-in-law is here. My mother-in-law is a famous artist who makes beautiful ktuvot. Uh, so uh, maybe we'll have a little uh, exhibit. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that next week. Uh, so wishing everyone a Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.